Marketing. How many of you um, want to be a marketer? One? Well, whether you realize it or not, you're going to be a marketer. When you go to look for a job, you're going to be marketing yourself. So what I'm going to tell you today is how marketing can apply both to life and to your own career. Okay? And it's a major that affects everything in business. People who are doing marketing are really the soul of the business. They're, they're what makes things go. And I'm going to show you why that's important for you personally. So it's the heart of the business. It's what makes businesses successful. Companies that don't have good marketing are very weak. They're not strong in their industries. Without it, you may have the best products or services known, but nobody's going to know about it. Because marketing is what tells people about the products and services that you have. Without it, companies crash and burn and end up having to close their doors. So whenever you see a bankrupt company, you've got a company that's not doing its good job in marketing. Okay, they're, they're subpar. So it is the whole business. It's everything about the business, from top to bottom, taken from the point of view of the customer. So it's how the customer sees the enterprise, the business itself, that determines the success of marketing. And what you'll see later is that customer value, which is the core concept of marketing, is very difficult to create. It's the hard part. Once you've got good customer value, if you make people aware of it, your product takes off. That's why people line up at the Apple store for the next version of the iPad or the next version of the iPhone, because they provide customer value. Now, I'm going to show you one of several videos here. To me, marketing is about values. This is a very complicated world. It's a very noisy world. And we're not going to get a chance to get people to remember much about us. No company is. And so we have to be really clear on what we want them to know about us. Now, Apple, fortunately, is one of the half a dozen best brands in the whole world, right up there with Nike, Disney, Coke, Sony. It is one of the greats of the greats, not just in this country, but all around the globe. And, but, but, but even a great brand needs investment and in caring if it's going to retain its relevance and vitality. And the Apple brand has clearly suffered from neglect in this area in the last few years. And we need to bring it back. The way to do that is not to talk about speeds and thieves. It's not to talk about nits and megahertz. It's not to talk about why we're better than Windows. The dairy industry tried for 20 years to convince you that milk was good for you. It's a lie, but they tried anyway. And <laughs> the sales were going like this. And then they tried Got Milk, and the sales are going like this. Got Milk doesn't even talk about the product. Matter of fact, it focuses on the absence of the product. <laughs> but, but, but the best example of all, and, and one of the greatest jobs of, of marketing in the, the universe has ever seen, is Nike. Remember, Nike sells a commodity. They sell shoes. And yet, when you think of Nike, you feel something different than a shoe company. In their ads, as you know, they don't ever talk about the products. They don't ever tell you about their air soles and why they're better than Reebok's air soles. What does Nike do in their advertising? They, they honor great athletes, and they honor great athletics. That's who they are. That's what they are about. Apple spends a fortune on advertising. You'd never know it. <laughs> You'd never know it. So when I got here, we, Apple just fired their agency. They were doing a competition with 23 agencies that, you know, four years from now would have picked one. And we blew that up, and we, <clears throat> we hired Shite, the ad agency that I was fortunate enough to work with years ago. We created some award-winning work, including the, the commercial vote of the best ad ever made in 1984 by advertising professionals. And um, we started working about eight weeks ago. And what we, the question we asked was, 
Our customers want to know who is Apple and what is it that we stand for. Where do we fit in this world? And what we're about isn't making boxes for people to get their jobs done, although we do that well. We do that better than almost anybody in some cases. But Apple's about something more than that. Apple, at the core, its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. That's what we believe. And we've had the opportunity to work with people like that. We've had an opportunity to work with people like you, with software developers, with customers who have done it in some big and some small ways. And we believe that in this world. People can change it for the better. And that those people that are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that actually do. And so what we're going to do in our first brand marketing campaign in several years is to, is to get back to that core value. A lot of things have changed. The market's a totally different place than it was a decade ago. And Apple's totally different. And Apple's place in it is totally different. And believe me, the products and the distribution strategies and the manufacturing are totally different. And we understand that. But values and core values, those things shouldn't change. The things that Apple believed in at its core are the same things that Apple really stands for today. And so we wanted to find a way to communicate this. And what we have is something that I am um, I'm very moved by. It honors those people who have changed the world. Some of them are living, some of them are not. But the ones that aren't, as you'll see, you know that if they'd ever used a computer, it would have been a Mac. <laughs> and <clears throat> the theme of the campaign is, is think different. It's the people honoring the people who think different and who move this world forward. And it's it is what we are about. It touches the soul of this company. So I'm gonna go ahead and roll it, uh, and I hope that you feel the same way about it I do. to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the only thing you can't do is ignore them change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. That was when Steve Jobs rejoined Apple after being fired. Um, yeah, it was before 2000. Um, it was before he got sick. And um, that was his maiden speech back to the company when he was just rehired and brought back in. And his whole idea, of course, is that the value of Apple was lost and he had to refine it, had to rediscover it. And right after that came the iPod, the iPhone, and the iMac, and the iPad. All of them, one after another. So what is value? Well, um, value doesn't come out of goods and services. It comes out of what's inside the brain. Okay? Value is not money. People always talk about things in terms of money, you know, how much money do you get? 
Forget money. Money is not value. Money is an indicator of value, but it isn't what constitutes value. Nike, the swoosh, has value in and of itself. It's considered to be worth about $1 billion, just that symbol. It's amazing what things are worth. Now, here's another video I want to show you, which um, usually kind of surprises people because they never thought about this. Here's a question for you. How much money would someone have to pay you to give up the internet for the rest of your life? Oh, wow. That is a fantastic question. Could a million dollars be enough for you to never use the internet again? Me? Nah. Well, I, I don't even know if I could take on that challenge. My whole life practically comes out of there. It would have to be something in excess of 15 to 20 million dollars. Couple million, billion. I think it would be in the billions. When I ask my students this question, oh, you couldn't pay me enough. Five million, no, 10 million. A billion dollars. SMU professor Michael Cox spends a lot of time thinking about new technology. So let me ask you a different question. How much do you have to pay in order to use them? 10 million? A million? 100,000? Even a thousand? No. Internet access costs just pennies a day. And so what the market has done is created a tremendous gap between worth, how much you'd pay for it, and cost. It's cheap to get online and getting cheaper all the time. In fact, the price of high-speed access has dropped more than 50% over the past two years. All kinds of things are getting cheaper. UNIVAC leads the field of electronic computing. The first computers were big and slow, and they cost millions of dollars. Here's a camera that's built with fun in mind. It wasn't long ago that this camera was a big deal. Same for video cameras like this. But today, smartphones come with video cameras, still cameras, and all kinds of other features built in. This is what the first cell phones looked like when they came out in the mid-80s. Price tag? $4,000. Wow. $4,000? <laughs> Nah. This product I saw recently, this is a 3G phone, was $39. Do you ever wait for the price of a product to go down before you buy it? Yes, ma'am. The um, iPad. Many of us wait for a cheaper price. But why do things get cheaper? When a new good comes out, we get in a line. We all get in a line for it. But the wealthiest people be in the front of the line. They pay the highest price and get the worst version of the product. My reaction is obviously, you know, Michael Douglas in uh, Wall Street on the beach. Astonish me, pal. Douglas plays the villain Gordon Gekko in the 1987 film. He's super rich, but his phone had no memory, no apps, no music. It's pretty much a brick with buttons. So during those first few years, products are very expensive as those development costs are paid. Developers experiment with the new technology and figure out how they can make big bucks by selling it to more people. But most people won't spend thousands of dollars for a cell phone, so they wait. If everybody waited, then the product would die on the vine. It would never make it to the market, so somebody is paying that cost of the first product to keep it from dying, and that's the rich. Real-life Gordon geckos buy the products when they're expensive. And that lets us enjoy the cheaper, better versions. Capitalism has its own built-in welfare transfer system. Imagine if cell phones still cost $4,000. Do you think if phones cost that much today, you would have one? No, I would not. But today, we all enjoy things that are vastly superior to what the richest people in the world owned just a short while ago. And many things, like aspirin and air conditioning and fully loaded cars, weren't even available a century ago. It's just ridiculously fun. And it goes far beyond the fun stuff. New technology lets us keep up with loved ones across the globe. It improves lives and saves lives in countless ways. And that was brought to you by the private sector. Cox says it starts with millions of Americans just going to work each day, trying to make things better for themselves and their families. Things get better because in order for me to succeed, I have to pay attention to your needs and wants. I have to create a product that you'll voluntarily buy, so I cannot make myself better off apart from making you better off as well. Apple can't force you to buy its products. The company makes so much money because it's really good at figuring out what people really like. That's why capitalism, paradoxically, it starts with self-interest, but it's guided by freedom, maximizes social welfare. Even during tough economic times, 
Americans live much more richly than previous generations, yet few of us consider ourselves rich. Oh, uh -oh. no. No, not rich. I'm, I'm, I'm like in the middle class. Just like middle class. I like, am in the middle. You know. But in some ways, maybe we're all millionaires and billionaires if we have something that's worth that much to us, something that lets us do so much. So think about it. How much is all of that worth to you? You might just be richer than you realize. So the value isn't the money, right? Now, when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, you saw the little speech he gave, he talked about value. It took him a long time to come out with the iPhone. It took forever, it seems like, after he got there. Do you know what he told his design staff the iPhone had to do? He told them, he said, look, I want a phone that has no buttons. And they said, we can't do that. He said, yes, you can. Go figure it out. Because he felt that was going to make his iPhone so different from everything else and so flexible compared to other phones that it would sell like crazy, and it did. So yeah. was that the first like, touchscreen uh, phone? That was when the first touchscreen came out. Way back then. Hmm? The other company stole from Apple. What's that? The other company stole the technology. All stole the technology, yeah. And that's why there's suits there's still suits going on between Samsung and Apple right now. When, when was the first year of the iPhone? First year of the iPhone? Yeah. Just a second, let me think. Two thousand four, I think, was the first four, one. Four? Yeah, and by five they had the third version out. Okay. So that's two thousand. Yeah. Now, the thing that made the iPhone so valuable, though, wasn't its, the phone itself, was it? What's the thing about the iPhone that made it so valuable up front? The apps. The, there are like one billion apps <laughs> that you can download to that thing, right? All kinds of games and stuff. So that's what we call value added in marketing. Other little companies, these app makers, created these apps that they'd sell for a dollar, right? That's the way value is added. Now, what did Steve Jobs do in addition to the iPod and the iPhone to the music industry? What did he create? iTunes. iTunes. Now, why was iTunes so important? Because it allowed you to buy a single song for 99 cents, right? Now, what that did was it destroyed the CD industry. <laughs> EMI and all the CD companies went away because of iTunes. <laughs> but that's what happens. That's why you have to be really successful at marketing your product. Those CDs couldn't compete with iTunes. iTunes just killed them. Now, it's one of the other lessons of marketing is we live in a very competitive world. You know, if you're not keeping up, finding out what new things there are, satisfying new needs and new wants in your customers, you're going to lose them because everybody wants something new. Right? We all like new. And this is kind of the way all that technology developed. It started way back here with the first modem <laughs> back in 1993 when the internet was first born. And now we're way down here with the iP Apple iPad. A lot of changes, right? A lot of, lot of rapid turnover of products and, and systems. So this is the whole model. Now I know this is kind of complicated, but you start with understanding what customers really should have and what they need and what they want. If you understand those things, what they have, what they need, and what they want, that gives you an insight into what else you can make for them that's different and new. If you can then come up with a way to deliver that in terms of superior value, like a buttonless phone that has apps, <laughs> you're on your way to creating a selling proposition that can't lose. With that, you can build awareness, trial, and use. Once you get use and people start to see how cool it is, you start delighting your customers, you retain them, then they buy the next version of it, right, because they're loyal, and that's why I have an iPhone 5, because <laughs> I'm a loyal Apple customer. That then turns into what we call lifetime value, because if they come out with an iPhone 6, I'll probably buy that too, right? And I'll keep buying the next version as long as they improve it and make it better. And then that leads to a, a sustainable business model and a profitable company. This is very long, takes a long time and a lot of money to create, but it's really easy to destroy with one bad product. Yes? Where would, um, like, let's say, since you're a loyal Apple customer, where on that model would you pass it on, like, the word of mouth to, you know, your family or whatnot that, you know, you need to stay in Apple? Where? That's right here. Okay. Advocacy. Yeah. That's where the word of mouth 
free, free advertising. Right. Guess what? All my grandkids have yeah, iPhones. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason for that, right? Okay. All right, so now the other lesson today that's really important is you understand life is marketing. You're always selling yourself. You sell yourself by what you wear. You sell yourself by what you do. You sell yourself by what you don't do. You sell yourself by your abilities and your skills. That's why you're in college, right? To get new skills and abilities. You're trying to raise your value, okay? That's all part of marketing. It's all part of marketing yourself. So, and you hear people say phrases like, don't sell yourself short. What does that mean when they say that? Don't sell yourself short. No idea? What's that? Okay, don't sell yourself cheap. What else? You have another idea? You're more valuable than you think. Than exactly. You're more valuable than you think you are. Right. You're more valuable than you think. You have skills and abilities you don't even know you have. Okay? And so you've got to learn to identify them and develop them. Just like in, in developing new products. We have to identify and develop new product ideas. You've got to identify and develop your own unique skills that you have and that you can take advantage of in the marketplace. So you need what's called a unique selling proposition. Apple's, when it first started with the iPhone, was it was a buttonless phone. Nobody else had it. You also need to realize that the perception you create in other people is their reality of you. They, if they get a misperception of you, that's real to them, even if it's wrong. So you have to make sure they know who you are in reality. You need to make yourself different from others. When you go into a job interview, you have to show why you're better than the next person. That's differentiation. If you can't get people to understand that, you're going to have a hard time and you'll end up in generation jobless, which we don't want, right? Okay, <laughs> just checking. With more than 14 million Americans looking for work, what's a guy got to do these days to get a job? Well, apparently, set up a website and make a YouTube video. Unemployed 24-year-old Matthew Epstein set his sights on a marketing job with Google and made a video to sell himself to the internet giant, playfully appearing in a fake mustache, drinking scotch in his boxers, working out, if you call that that, and at one point getting a pedicure. All this to deliver a message. Ooh. My name is Matthew Epstein, and I want to work for you. That. I know, I know. You look at me and all you see is a man with a mustache that makes angels weep. But I'm more than a man with a mustache. I'm a lover, a product marketer, and a digital strategist with a passion for bringing products to market online and offline. Well, the video paid off. It went viral, and guess what? He got a job. Matthew Epstein, who looks nothing like the guy in that video. Please tell me, Matthew, those aren't your toes. Uh, by the way, first off, thank you for having me, Chris. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And they actually, they actually are my toes. And let me tell you, if you've ever walked into a, a pedicurist asking to film, film them painting your toes, it's, it's a pretty awkward experience. And I'm also happy to announce I am wearing pants for this interview in respect uh, of you and your viewers. Maybe even too much information there, but I'm pleased to hear it. Okay. <laughs> you called your website, googlepleasehiremecom How did this all come about? So like, like a lot of Americans out there, I, I lost my job and I immediately uh, started for applying jobs traditional ways. So, um, you know, dropping off paper resumes, applying on LinkedIn. But, but what happened was after about three weeks of applying, I, I, I couldn't even get a call back. I couldn't even get anyone just to, to tell me, no, we're not interested. And I really became, I became disheartened. I, I, I started questioning myself. Um, I started panicking, thinking, am I, am I going to be able to find a job? This is what, this is what the economy is really like. And I decided, um, I actually I didn't decide, I recalled a quote from Albert Einstein who, who once said, um, you know, doing, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is insanity. And that's kind of what it felt like, insanity. So I, I decided to go in a completely different direction. And if I, I decided if I'm going to go big, I decided what's bigger than getting um, the biggest technology company in the world to basically give you a call and give you a job. Well, more than 720,000 people viewed that website. Nearly half a million have seen your video. Were you, I mean, obviously you wanted Google to watch it, but were you surprised by how huge it became? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was absolutely flabbergasted. In fact, 
I was I was so worried about the fact that I wasn't going to get I wasn't uh, Google wasn't going to see me that I actually hired a propeller plane to fly around Google's headquarters with my URL. Did you but ever hear from them, by the way? I did. Yeah, I actually had several interviews with them. Along but you're with going back. You're going to work for somebody else. I am. I am. I'll tell a company you, called SIGFIG out, out in San Francisco. It's an amazing story, and we're glad you got the job. Congratulations. And uh, just, you know, for what it's worth, stay away from the pedicure shop. Thank really, you. Really, nobody and should have to see that. Thanks. And everyone out there looking for a job, I really wish you luck. Keep fighting. Matthew Epstein, thank you so much. So that's Matthew. <laughs> and now this is how to really get a job at Google if you'd like to. For every young person, a job at Google is something to strive for. It's a great place to work, the food is free, and it's an exciting place to work. You're taking on big problems. But the question is, how do you get a job at Google? They're very, very selective. I spent a lot of time when working on Indiflex talking to the people at Google, some of whom were in the hiring councils and human relations, and here's what I broke down to what it is that can get you a job at Google. First of all, you have to be smart. You have to be smart and nimble on your feet able to protect your decisions and during the interview process they're going to test that out. Second, you have to be technical. Even if you're not doing a technical job in, in engineering, it's essential that you have an understanding about how things work in a technical sense. Google takes that very, very seriously. So even if you're not a computer science major, try to take some computer science courses. Third, the data they ask of every job applicant is your grade point average in college and your SAT score. And even if you've been in the workforce for 10, 20 years, they ask these questions. What was your GPA in college? And some people I talked to who were like 40 years old said, I, I don't remember, I don't remember there. But they're going to get it and they're going to say, well, why did you get a C in this course? Or why was your SAT low? Were you sick that day? Or Google cares what school you went to. Larry and Sergey, who were the co-founders of Google, went to Stanford. And in their experience, people who went to good schools make good employees. Even though it's not impossible to get into Google if you didn't go to a top school, it's a lot easier. Finally. If all else fails, and maybe you don't meet the standards in your GPA, or you didn't go to the right school, uh, Google sometimes looks for things that you've done that are really extraordinary, because they like their employees to do extraordinary things. Uh, there was one case where someone uh, didn't quite meet the standards, and it turned out that he was the foosball champion of Italy. And Sergey Brin thought that was pretty cool, so he said, let's hire him anyway. You could learn a lot more about the employees of Google and everything else by reading in the Plex how Google thinks, works, and shapes our lives. Thanks a lot. That advice about technical skills, that goes double today. Social media, which you all know as Facebook and Twitter, are, is the driving force in marketing today. If you don't know about social media, they're not going to want to hire you. So you need to understand how social media works and what, how social influence works. Now these are the objectives of the marketing major. They're in the catalog. They would be in any syllabus you would get. And they're really simple, basically. We want to develop good business competencies in our marketing students. Competency means skills and abilities that you can bring to solving marketing problems. That's basically what we're about. It's very career focused. We try to give you active learning experiences through simulations, through projects, through real world experience, doing things that are not inside the school but are outside the school. And we try to get people involved in business related activities like helping a company write their own marketing plan or something like that. Those kinds of experiences look really good on a resume when you go in to interview for a job because they see you've done something rather than just sit in a seat. Anybody can sit in class, right? But not everybody gets a chance to write a marketing plan for a real company. These are the courses you'd have to take. There are 15 that are required. Um, 350 is basically our principal's course. It's the introductory course that everybody takes in the business school. Then we get into consumer behavior, marketing research, and marketing strategy. Then we look at the four P's in those courses. We talk about price, promotion, product, and place. Okay? Those are the five kind of basics of marketing. They're covered in those, intro, those uh, basic required courses. And we have some specialty courses that you take two of in order to round out your degree. You can take one, any one, two of these courses and they count toward your elective or what we call selectives for your marketing degree. So that's the basics of the major. Okay? Four basic courses that everybody takes and then you choose among these six courses here. 
Now, as I said, marketing is social media. Social media is the most influential thing in the world right now in trying to, in trying to spread a message. That's what marketing is all about, is spreading that message. You can't buy something you're not aware of, right? You have to know about it first before you can ever purchase it. And you see maps like this showing social influence areas all around the world where companies that market globally like Apple will track their sales of their iPhones or iPads or any other device through social media. We have some specialty pr uh, programs. One of them is resort tourism. If you're interested in working in, in a hotel, motel, restaurant, anything that has to do with resort and tourism, this is the program for you because it gives you three internships in hotels, restaurants, any other tourism-related venue right here in Myrtle Beach. Or if you want to go out of town, you can do that too. You can go do your internships elsewhere. When you talk about jobs, marketing is a, an area that has some great support. Um, one of them is marketing sales. And this is a, is a website that tells you what different jobs are worth in the open market. You can search by, uh, pro by title or by city and state, and it will tell you what jobs are, are in that city and state and how much they pay. So you can kind of target where you might want to apply. We also have the American Marketing Association has a website that is unsurpassed in terms of its utility for young people. I think a, a student membership in the AM American Marketing Association is like $25 a year, and it gives you access to everything on their website. And you see here they have a career management link right here, and it opens up into a career resource center. Here you can search or post jobs, right? If you were a company, you'd post. If you're you, you'd search, and it would show you all the jobs that you can, that you can possibly apply for. Um, it has other links down here for advice on how to write a resume, how to get hired into certain companies. Uh, a lot of companies will post uh, guidebooks on here for people who want to join their company. Like if you want to join an ad agency, and you might look up Ogilvy and Mather, and there would be their tips for getting hired at Ogilvy and Mather. And if you follow that, it kind of gives you the roadmap to getting in there. Uh, this, this website is uh, fully searchable. Um, you can do all kinds of things with it. And what I always normally tell students to do is you have to start looking early. You have to kind of begin with an end in mind, figure out what kind of job you would want early on in your college career, and then kind of design what you do in college to target the things that that job requires. It helps you get ready rather than going out there blind at the end of your four years saying, what should I do now? You know, it kind of gives you a, guide, a roadmap and, and guidebook for you to get where you need to go. Now, um, I'll answer any questions that you have now. If you, if you have anything in the back of your mind, you want to, want to ask me about marketing or what kind of jobs people can get in marketing. Is it only offered as a major? Or is it uh, th we're starting a marketing minor. Okay. Um, that probably won't come online until a year from now because it takes that long to get it online. Okay. But we are pl um, putting it through the process of getting a, a marketing minor. What's yeah. the average salary, salary of marketing? Well, it depends on the position. Um, the starting out position? Um, I would say if you, if you were a four-year degree with decent grades and had done some unusual things on campus, like been a leadership position in some organization, you'd probably start at forty-five to 55000 in a, at a lower level marketing position. Now, just so you'll know, um, a lot of times people who are in marketing jobs in a corporation, in a company, don't start in marketing. They actually start in sales. And the reason that's true is that a lot of people in business believe that you don't really understand marketing until you've been face to face with customers and worked directly with customers. Because the marketing is kind of removed from the actual field. You know, you're not talking to customers. You're, you're in an office in a, in a company somewhere. So they say, get, your, get two years in sales. Go out there and show us you can actually sell the products that this company makes to customers who have money to buy it. And once you've understood that, if, if you're good at it, usually what they'll do is they'll just pluck you right out and put you right in a product management position inside the company. So if you're like top in your territory or district and you're doing really well, they'll just like, get that, <laughs> bring them in here because they understand how to, this thing works. 
So the, the more you can display that ability in a sales position, and actually having sales experience while you're in college, if you take a, if you take a job that involves sales, like if you work in a bank as a teller, right, or in um, a restaurant as the um, host or hostess, or even if you're a waiter or waitress, they consider that sales because you're in direct contact with the customers. And that's what business people want to know is do you understand what customers are like, right? Because that's where the insight comes from is understanding their world. And without having any contact with them, how can you understand them? Okay, does that make sense? Anything else? Is marketing more than just commercials and these big billboards on images? Oh yeah, that's a, just one small part of it. Like what else? It's everything from, like I said, social media management, mm -hmm. um, Direct uh, marketing is things like mailers and leave behinds, things of that nature. Promotions are things that go on inside stores, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So is there a difference, like is marketing and advertising linked or separated? Yeah, here, here's kind of the way it works. Marketing is sort of subsumes advertising, public relations, sales, and promotion. Okay, okay so there are really four right. pillars that, hold, that marketing has some effect on. Yeah. And I'm a marketing major. What, what steps would you make to take care of kids like accounting or? You have to take all those basic business stuff. Yeah, you have to take counting. The basic accounting and finance things are required in the business core. So once you finish the business core courses, you will have accounting, finance, economics, okay, management. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then what you want to do is concentrate in marketing. Now, if you're interested in that kind of a job, I would say you'd want to take the retailing. Uh, you know, selective and things like that. You'd want to get those courses that relate closely to marketing specialties and fields like that. Mm -hmm. That would be retailing and sales management. Okay. Anything else? When it comes to like, um, like you said, sales and whatnot, is it only limited to companies who are like developing, you know, like Apple, like developing new technologies or new products, or is it? Know, like Any sales. Any sales. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what kind of companies do you work with? What kind of companies do we work with? Um, we have an internship director who's in the Wall Center on the second floor, and she has long lists of companies, um, all kinds of companies, some local, some out in you know New York City, down in Miami, California. So if what you see, if you know what you want. They'll find you something. <laughs> yeah, usually what happens is people walk in and say, can I have an internship? <laughs> or can I have a job? <laughs> you know, it's kind of vague. So the more specific you can be, the better they can help you find what you want. Yeah? Can you take an internship any, any year of your college career? You could have one tomorrow if you want to go get it. Yeah. So it's better if you have an internship, like for, can you have internships with the same company for four years? Well, what, what most hiring people will tell you, they'll say, we'd like you to have an internship every year. So that would be four across your four years, if you can manage that, at different places. Because they want you to know, see how different operations work and get experience and exposure to different ways of doing business. And that means you need to have four different ones. And the more you have, the more you rise up the list. <laughs> Just go over to Career Services and ask them. Or go down, go down to the Wall Center and ask them. Yeah. In fact, in some majors in, this, in our school here, the, the PGM students are required to have one the freshman year. That's a requirement. They have one every year. They do four internships. Three three, um, three, three credit internships and one six. And the um, resort tourism people do three also. I know they do three. I don't think there's any restriction on you getting an internship. You just have to want it. Most people don't, you know, they don't think that way. See, I always tell people those are great elective hours. <laughs> you know, they go down there in that last bucket <laughs> on your program evaluation, electives. To see internships and electives is really good because that means you're out there getting real world experience as you're going through classes. Anything else?
do all business majors take that intro marketing class, or is that just the intro core marketing? 350 is a core course, okay. yeah. Yeah, principles of marketing is a core business core course. So even the accountants take that. But you'd be surprised how many people in accounting and finance are realizing they wish they had a marketing minor or a double major. <laughs> because they get into financial planning and stuff like that, and they need to know how to market. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, what kind of jobs can you get after graduating with a marketing minor? Well, usually, like I said, people will start in sales. And they'll get into a company that has marketing positions. And then they'll do an internal application upward, or they'll get plucked out of sales. But the, the if sales you kind of have to do with like advertising, like us advertising. Sales. Well, no, sales is, is direct customer contact. That means you're you're face to face with customers. Okay? Now, once you get up into something, you'll get up into what's called an assistant or associate product management position. Okay, that means you work for a product manager who's really in charge of a product. So like you might have a product manager that's in charge of Coke, okay? And you'd be an assistant, and he might have four assistants that work in different markets. Like one might be institutional Coke that'd be selling to McDonald's. Others might be uh, retail Coke selling through grocery stores, okay? And so they would be in charge of those specific markets. And then if you're very good at that, you would move up into the product management level. And then if you're good at that, you move into senior product management, it means you'd have more product managers under you, and if you're really good, you'd become a director or a vice president. Okay, so that's kind of the way it goes up, upward. And, and like I said, most of the time people come in through direct sales, then up into an assistant or associate position, then onward. Does that make sense? Okay. Anybody home? Me. Yeah. Me. Question? No. Thought there was one in there. <laughs> Anything else? I'd really encourage you, if you're interested in internships, to go to the Wall Center down in 228. Talk to Ellen Ryan. She's great. She can hook you up with all kinds of things. She knows so many people. <laughs> she has lists of these things. All right, well, I guess that's all I got then. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.